This is episode number 54 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan. Thank you very much for joining me today. This is the podcast that inspires others to push the limits of their reptile husbandry by promoting the importance of high-level creative care individualized for each reptile. If you are ever looking to get in touch with me, you can send me an email at hello at animalsathome.ca. That's .ca, not .com. Or follow me on Instagram at animalsathome.ca and send me a DM there. Maybe you want to say hi, ask a question, or recommend a guest for the podcast. I'm always happy to hear from the listeners. If you are looking for ways to support the podcast, the easiest thing you can do is go to the Apple's podcasting app and give it a five-star rating or share the content on social media. That is always a huge help. If you do want to buy an Animals at Home t-shirt, you can go to animalsathome.ca slash shop and $5 for every t-shirt does automatically get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And as I said last week, there is a massive slowdown in the production and printing of the shirts. So if you have ordered a shirt within the last few weeks, I apologize that you haven't received it yet. It will eventually get get to you but the printer that prints the shirts which is down in South Carolina they are very behind and things are very slow I think they are reduced staff and everything else to do with the COVID regulations so once they get back to full production the shirts will get sent out it just may take a few weeks and I appreciate your patience Thank you very much to our sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. Go check them out. I do have links in the show notes as well as the YouTube description box. It is an affiliate link, so if you do pick up some substrate or some lighting or something like that, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you. And of course, that goes to supporting the podcast. On today's episode of the podcast, I am speaking with Stefan Venicus. Stefan is the creator of the YouTube channel, Terrarium Channel, and he has one of the nicest collections I have seen online. And what I mean by that is he has a large amount of animals, a couple different reptile rooms in his home, but the care quality for each of the animals that he has is seriously top notch. I highly recommend going to his YouTube channel after you've listened to this podcast and go check out the animals he has. He has a wide collection of really cool Asian species, lots of Asian snakes, many different species of turtle, Chinese alligator lizard, I believe a pair of Western green mamba. His collection is very unique, but what was most unique about it is this care standard that he has. So we talked about what, where that came from, the philosophy that he has. We talked about his, uh, which I was really fascinated about, his cold room, the room that he has a, a few animal species that actually go through a hibernation and he keeps that room as low as five or six degrees Celsius in the winter. We talked about how he manages that. We discuss stud books and how you can get your animals involved in a stud book, what a stud book is and why it's important for the hobby. And of course, we talk about his YouTube channel and the plans that he has for it in the future. As I say in the intro in a couple of seconds here, I really love highlighting YouTube channels that are out doing the right thing. They aren't just looking for clickbait or sensationalized material. They're actually providing good quality content. And that is exactly what Stefan is doing with his channel. Let's listen to the conversation. Enjoy. All right. Well, Stefan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for joining me today. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me on. Great. Yeah, you have a really interesting channel. We're obviously going to talk about your YouTube channel. I, I like to highlight people who are really giving good quality information and have the, the, the videos that you show, you can just tell that you have really great care for your animals. So we're going to, I really want to jump into that with you. But before we do that, how did this start? When, when, did, your, when did animals kind of pop into your life? Oh, man. First off, I, I really appreciate uh, that. But um, when it started to pop, yeah, when I was I, uh, too young to really remember when it was the exact time. Uh, my mother was also big into animals. You know, we had all kinds of just household pets, dogs, etc. And yeah, like like many small young boys, I was just fascinated with with nature and also with dinosaurs. But like this Lego castle with dinos, and they always need to play around. And at a certain point, I was at a friend's house and his dad has like this terrarium in his living room with the Felsuma uh, Madagascariensis, so the Madagascar day geckos. Yeah. And I was just like in awe. I was like, is this a possibility? You know, is this, is this really something you can have? And I was so fascinated by the idea. And I, I bought my parents for so, so long. And I believe I was nine or ten i got like this first terrarium which my dad built for me with skinks and knolls and and the tachydrome is in there so you know the typical i don't know what i'm doing just buying what i like yeah and stuffed it in there and it just grew from there and i've been keeping reptiles ever since so but up until that point did you have a passion for reptiles or was that really what sparked it off originally seeing those day geckos uh it, 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 that was what really sparked it off um, of course, I was always looking 
for animals in, in nature. I lived close to a river, so we were catching crabs. And I had my t-shirt full of toads when amazing season had arrived. But when I saw that was a possibility, and I saw that with the live plants and these, these incredible looking geckos, which is funny because I never kept them myself until now. Right. <laughs> But I was just so in awe. I needed to, yeah. Because no in, more. in the Netherlands, you you can there's you there's actually a, a somewhat of a wide variety of wildlife in terms of reptiles and amphibians that you can go find, like herping herping wise. Yes, absolutely. And now I know that I go out pretty much every weekend looking for all kinds of uh, animals, and and I love it. But until that day, I I really didn't know. I really didn't know. It was also not close to me, and I was young, and I did not. Have the internet like it's available now, you know. So I had no idea. So fr- from there, with kind of that first terrarium that your dad built, how did it start to grow? What did you did it just grow slowly over time as you kind of went through high school? Um, well, pretty much even even before that, when I was like, I, I believe I was somewhere like eleven or twelve. Uh, I, I, as soon as I discovered it, I went through books and my dad has a bookstore. So that was awesome. So every book about reptiles he could get, he gave to me. And I just started digging through them and cutting out pictures from these books and putting them in my crab books. I, I still have it. And uh, just digging into them and separating them per category, uh, uh, red snakes and, and uh, king snakes, you know, milk snakes, lump of belts, etc. And all it was 11 or 12, I got my snake. And and yeah, I love my mother for it, but she was always so supportive. And once it really started to get off and they they saw I was really yeah, into it, they, yeah, I got a, a Lampropeltis and I got a gray red snake, which was a terrible idea at the moment because he had a, not the best disposition for <laughs> a child. So yeah, that's just how it took off. And then I started working earning a bit more money. Uh, I got an internship at a pet store, uh, a pet store I later owned. And um, yeah, that's just really how it grew. And I started to breed and then you start to, you know, if you breed something, you trade. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. It's funny, yeah, it's interesting because clearly you have this sense of organization about you, you know, even as a young child making these categorical books and everything, because when I see your collection and I want to get into that as well, it's like everything is organized. You have these really cool tags and everything. It's, it's sort of, obviously that's a big part of, of, of the way you approach the trade. So are you, in terms of work, obviously your life revolves around reptiles. Are you still part of the pet store or? Uh, No, I quit about three years ago. Um, I do have a website now, uh, Het Terrarium in Dutch, the Terrarium, which is, it has an online store part, but it's more about info and just having a name out there in case I want to expand on that in the future. I really love my job now, but I have to be honest, I would love to do something yeah, more in depth with reptiles in, in the long term again. So that's what I do uh, now. Yeah. And of course, I work at a school now. Uh, sorry for interrupting. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I work at a school now, and uh, there we we teach children how to properly take care of all kinds of animals, and it starts at mouse and guinea pigs, and I, of course I love that stuff. But we also work with all kinds of reptiles, and it teach about how you need to keep fish in aquariums because to me, aquariums and and reptiles it's pretty much goes hand in hand. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I do now also. I I love that idea. I've never heard of that in terms of being, if I was in school right now, I feel like that would have been a perfect course for me or a class when you're a young kid. Like that sounds amazing. Are pretty much all the kids just obsessed with that? Do they really love learning about the animals? Um, You can do see a bit of a distinct difference. Uh, There's a group of children that uh, really don't know what they want yet. And I Fully understand that because how can you know what you want when you're at <laughs> that age? I, yeah. I, I even still don't know what I want at some point. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's also a group that's just fascinated by uh, by animals and they really want to build uh, a profession uh, from that. Uh, it, you, you do see that people, when they start off, their interest is kind of narrow. So it's either reptiles or either birds or either... And as soon as they grow into the, the education, you see them um, acknowledging that all animals bring something and are, yeah, 
absolutely interesting in all kinds of ways. Yeah, yeah. There's the, even a lot of similarities just in life in, in itself, and you can kind of appreciate that. In terms of your collection now, it's I know you, actually yesterday was perfect timing because you post a little tour of one of your rooms, but h how many rooms or how, what is the collection that you have at your home right now? Because it seems pretty extensive. Um, it, it does not feel extensive uh, until I start counting. Uh, that's one of the reasons I don't do like this all my pets videos, etc. Because to me, it's not really about how many I got, just the way I keep them. Uh, but I have three reptile rooms. And not even that those are stacked full, but it's just I, I keep my rooms all at a certain uh, temperature range and humidity. And uh, I choose animals that fit in that uh, uh, room and in those gradients uh, simply because it's also easier for me to maintain them properly. So how many animals do I have? I believe I'm between 70 to 100 animals. And they seem to be mostly Asian species. Is, is that something that you just developed over time and you just fell in love with that sector of the world? Yes, somehow uh, that area just fascinates me, all the animal, of course, all reptiles are, you know, I could go on of all the stuff I like, but somehow the Asian stuff really fascinates me. Also the wildlife over there itself and all the floras, all the different types of plants and environments. And it is also a way for me to say, okay, because we all have the tendency to collect, you know, that's part of us. Uh, every human has it, including us hobbyists. Like, I want this and I want that and I want this. Um, but sticking to Asian also helps me to, to focus on uh, a certain group of animals. And luckily, there are some amazing animals in there. And uh, I, yeah, I just love the animals I keep at the moment. Can you just list off maybe just a few so people can kind of visualize what sort of animals you're keeping? And then I want to get into them. Uh, I'm going to ask a few other questions, but just so the listeners can build a, a little image in their brain. Yeah, for sure. No problem. Uh, well, uh, let, let's start. Uh, I keep at the moment, I'm just starting again with some uh, Asian red snakes or the Oyo cryptophis, uh, Gonyosoma. Uh, at the moment, I'm caring for some Elava carinata, which are getting more popular um, at the moment. I have uh, Heloderma holidum holidum, which is, of course, not Asian. It's one of the small kings. Um, and I have a lot of turtles, so Malremis, Manaurias, uh, Sakalias, the big headed turtle, one of my favorites. You, you will also, also notice that on the channel. I, I love her. And then I also keep the uh, venomous snakes, so uh, Trimurosurus and Ophophis, all kinds of different uh, pit vipers. And I have a cobra now, and the other non-Asian animals I have are my Western Green Mambas, the Dendroaspis. Yes, quite an extensive list. Yes, it is. Yeah, it, and the, is there? Do you have like a direction that you want to head with the collection? Like, is there a, a a grand purpose for you for the animals that you're keeping, or do you just gravitate towards things that you want to keep that you like? Um, it's it's a mix of that. It's a, it's a mix of that. I think the most important thing is you got to st keep stuff you like, no matter how rare or interesting or common it is, simply because the more you like your animals, you, the more involved you will be. Um, but I do have a direction, and that's, that's pretty much two different ones. One is, for me, the fun stuff, and that is, uh, of course, it's all fun, but just having them for fun and enjoyment are the snakes. Because I like to keep them and I can breed them. I, I love breeding snakes. I can't help it. Um, and another big part for me are the Asian turtles and also the Shinosaurus, the, the Chinese uh, crocodile lizards. I I'm not that good with them. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, those to me are next to the fact that they are a lot of fun and they are a bit more stimulating. You know, turtles are just not always as easy as snakes for me. And so there's a bit of experiment there and it's new and it's fun. And it's also those, that is a group of animals that, um, yeah, it does not have a great time in nature. You know, they're, they're being decimated for uh, wildlife trafficking and for medicine and their environment is being destroyed. So that's also a, a group to me is liking like taking a bit of responsibility for the animals I keep and trying to give something back. So I really focus on those, but um, yeah, that takes a bit longer, you know, they, they take a longer time to age, et cetera. So that's just something that's building. So in the meantime, I'm focusing on my snakes 
and uh, I hope the turtle collection at the end will be absolutely the biggest collection, part right. of the collection. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it uh, for sure it's one of the best large collections I've seen in terms of just the quality of care. Like you can, like you said, you can find videos all my pets all over the place online, and you have someone with eighty animals, and every enclosure they go to is paper towel or just aspen or it's something boring, and there's there's no care put into each one, and it seems like almost pretty much every animal you have has a really nice, well done, naturalistic enclosure. Are you doing that all yourself? Do you have somebody helping with you, helping you with it? Or is it just a hundred percent you? It's a hundred percent me. <laughs> That's yeah, amazing. It's hundred percent me. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, again, I do appreciate that. And I love the fact that people are, are starting to notice that. Of course, I also keep animals in a very simplistic way. Uh, sometimes, especially when they are new, uh, that's, that's, that is something I do emphasize on, on the channel. Um, I, I love all the natural setups and, and it's a big part for me, especially with snakes that pretty much don't move 99% of the time. Asian pit vipers don't move that much or they move at night. Um, but when they are new in my collection, you do see me putting the animals in the wrecking system on simple substrate and not too man, much stuff around it. But that's an obvious choice, but not something I would like to do in the long term, of course. Yeah, I think you, I've, I've heard you talk about racks as well before, and I think you have a really good philosophy in terms of when to use a rack. It makes sense to use a rack for some species, but it's particularly new species, young species when, when they're babies or quarantine. Those are all totally great reasons. But eventually you want to be able to see the animal and have it interact with its you know, surroundings. Yes, absolutely. 100%. Uh, some of the stuff uh, I, I sometimes say to my students or when I had to show up to clients, they always said uh, my, my this or that animal doesn't do anything. And then I say, has it, has it anything to do? You know, <laughs> yeah. what, what are the options? Yeah, yeah. That's and a really good like, question. Yeah. So that, that's the way I also approach uh, the way I keep my animals. And then it also keeps it fun for me. It's not only good for the animals, it stimulates them. But it's also fun for me to see that, that they are moving around and I see the plants growing. It's an ever-changing environment in a small glass box. And uh, yeah, that's what makes it so interesting to me also. Yeah, yeah, there is nothing better than watching the animal behave in a natural way after you've spent the time putting it together. And so in terms of that, that style of husbandry, because it's definitely a style and it's, it's a style that I'm hoping in North America, we start, I'm starting to see a lot more of it, which is great. And, but we do still have an industrial side. I'm sure Europe does as well with, you know, just very, very plain setups. It, why why do you care that way why is it important i mean obviously we, we've you've kind of touched on a few things but was that right from the very beginning the way that you always wanted to care for your animals or did you transition into more of a naturalistic way through the years um that's a good question when i was young it, it was it started that way and that was pretty much the only method i knew really you know we all the there was an old-time magazine called la certa there was a lot of uh, old school information in there, and I got that from somebody that so I was interested. And in there, they all they never talked about boxes or industrialized or uh, breeding, etc. It was all about uh, getting this new interesting species because even then, uh, a pochona or a, a Russian red snake was like, this is so new, you know. And um, it was always a terrarium, and and of course they had very different way of heating and lighting than we have now. Yeah, a little bit sketchy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. So we had like this halogen bulbs and, and a heating uh, strip and uh, terracotta around heating. But it, was, it was very different. But it was all branches and it was fake plants, but still I put in fake plants. And when I get, got a bit older, I put in live plants, etc. cetera. Uh, so that, that's pretty much how I started. Uh, I did go to the more simplistic way for a while. Um, and that simply had the reason it was easier for me to maintain because of time at that uh, point of time in my life. And I found like this weird color in the monocles Cobra uh, variant. And of course I wanted to keep the whole clutch, but then you have like 25 Cobras at once. So you need to house all of those. So then I went to the more industrialized stuff and at a certain point, I had a stress drive from, from work. I had the best tour then. And I got home and I had like 
all these code rust in these boxes and you, you can't just open them, put your hand in there, of course, you know? And then I was like, okay, I'm done with this. Yeah. And uh, that's when I quit. And a few years ago, I only had like three or four snakes left. And I'm, yeah. I got it. So, so when you say you quit, were you like, I'm getting out of the hobby or were you saying I need to change the way I care for it? Or were you just kind of fed up with, with the work that you were doing at that time with the animals? It, it was a combination. It was the most important to, thing to me is that at, at the start, it is a hobby and a hobby needs to be fun. You need to enjoy it. And uh, I was not enjoying it the way I was uh, doing it at that point. So either was with the, I also grab blood items and those were also a very simplistic way. And I loved it, but um, it, it was, it was just not fun coming back and then having to, such a collection in such a way. And it was just not the perfect combination. But I think that's the best answer to give. It was just part of me being like, okay, this is way too much work. So I realized then, you know, Collecting, collecting is not always the way to go. Yeah. Um, and this way does not stimulate me. I, I do not look forward entering this room and, and uh, changing all the water bowls. And I do change all the water bowls of pretty much all my animals pretty much daily. So, and that's, yeah, that's quite a lot of work. And if you're not looking up to that, uh, you're, yeah, you're in for a rough time if you have 60 or more animals. Yeah, yeah. The the actual amount of work isn't the issue. It's more the fulfillment you're getting from the work, right? Because you're saying you're probably doing more work now, but you are eager to get into those rooms and do it just because the fulfillment that you get from that work is totally different. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's very different uh, than it was. And now I don't experience it as a lot of work. I know how much time I spend in those rooms, but I... Uh, yeah, it's not the same uh, way. Absolutely not. Yeah. It's a lot better. So in, in Europe or in Netherlands, is, is there any bylaws in terms of enclosure size and whatnot? Those are some things that we see sort of in Germany as well as I think maybe in the UK, they're starting to add some of these bylaws and rules. Do you guys have anything quite like that? Unfortunately, uh, not yet, at least not for uh, reptiles and amphibians. They're just starting that with some small um, rodents, etc. you know, mammals but that's only guidelines. There's nothing really mandatory by law. Um, so, which is a shame at the end. I, I don't think uh, that that's a bad way to go as long as it's done by, by experts and people that, that know what they are talking about. Um, because I think in the long term, with the way people look at our hobby, um, it is either that or no hobby at all because uh, they are very strong here on just trying to eradicate the, the way we keep animals as, as we do. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. a bit of self-regulation would be awesome. Yeah. I know. I, I totally agree. I think as long as it's coming from people who are in the industry and saying, Hey, these are the standards that you should be using. That's actually a good thing because, or else it will be taken from us completely because the people who aren't following the rules are the ones that the animal rights people grab and say, hey, look, these how people care for reptiles. Even though there are people like you who do take great care, that wouldn't matter if uh, if it all gets taken away. So yeah, so you do think in, in places like Germany where it is mandatory that actually works quite well and keeping the care standards quite high? Um, I, I, of course, I don't live in Germany, so I only see from the outside how it works. Right. And I, Sometimes also see different laws uh, per um, council when it also comes to which animals you can keep and how you need to register, et cetera. But I, I don't think it's a bad idea to at least think about it and have discussions about it because over the last few years, you, you have seen like the minimum required size of a lot of animals in books and in care sheets. And I hate that word, uh, et cetera. You just see them. Getting smaller. Get smaller and smaller. So I, 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 yeah, I won't be too, of course, I will be hesitant because it depends on the people that will put it in place and what are the reasons behind it. But I don't think it's a, it's a, something we need to exclude for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. But, and one of the other things that you do, which is really interesting is, you know, you have these species, a lot of the species, like we said, are from Asia and you, you have an obsession almost with making sure the plants and everything are also from Asia. Yes. That, that's amazing. 
Yeah, that's, I don't know how that came. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I, it's like I say, that sometimes for me, the aquarium and reptile hobby goes pretty much hand in hand. And uh, when I teach about about uh, keep the aquariums, I, I always say, don't you dare to put a, a, a guppy with like a, a barb uh, species from Asia, you know, don't you dare. I just somehow I don't like it. And I've been preaching it pretty much ever since uh, I, I think that way. Uh, I don't know the exact reason why it is, but it's not that difficult to do also. It's, just, it's so simple just to... Uh, find out what what the indigenous uh, flora is and look at the plants over there and add it to your setup. And it's also really fun just to dig into it and, and see uh, what the environment looks like, some which plants are there, etc. Of course, probably your crested gecko doesn't mind at all when it's on the Bermuda yet. It, it won't care. <laughs> but yeah. to to me, it's when I see that stuff. Friends send pictures to me like. Of their snakes, of, of their reptiles, and they know there's a plant there from a different uh, environment, and they're, they're like, oh, oh, you know, they're <laughs> taunting me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I th it yeah. probably goes back to your that instinct to be organized and have things in correct categories. I, is your opinion on hybridizing species? I'm, I'm, my guess is that you probably don't like that, but maybe you have a different opinion. Oh, that's, that's a good question. I, um, to me. Um, of course, there's a bit of nuance there, and th th that's always the case. That's also uh, when I talk to people about ideas, there's also always a form of nuance. But to me, um, in the base, a mutation or a hybrid is pretty much the same. There's almost no natural value there. So it's just a pet you're going to keep, and it's for your enjoyment. So. Uh, to that extent, it's almost the same to me, but there's a, uh, a, a danger or a chance, of course, that there are hybrids and that don't look like a hybrid. They're not a very obvious hybrid. Like, for instance, I, I work a lot with Asian turtles and uh, there's a group of people that are very interested, mo mo mostly uh, in the Asian countries with hybrids of those, and they can sometimes look like one of the two species, but both species are probably in at least uh, crit or at least endangered. You know, they're in, uh, they are one of the most endangered uh, uh, vertebrates, I believe. Sorry, I don't know the uh, English name right away. There it is, and then someone has this, yeah, hybrid and sells it, and that person doesn't know it's a hybrid and starts to mix it in with, with pure lines. Then of course you're you're damaging a species as it is. So I hope I uh, laid it out correctly. Yeah, but, yeah, no, uh, it, there's I a think fine line. That, yeah, that there's a big danger for me. Something like a, a bat eater, that's a reticulated python with a I don't know. Um, that that's obviously a hybrid. Mm -hmm. And of course I have my ideas about uh, mixing those species. But in essence, to me, it's not different than uh, a mix with four different genes of, of mutations in the snake. Because the natural value is pretty much gone. It's pet at that moment. To yeah. Me. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I've never thought about it that way. And yeah, it's true that if you do compare it on a natural value scale, a morph is a as worthless as it can get pretty much. And, and same with the hybrid. So as long as things are organized in a way that you know what it is, that's probably okay. But when things get so mixed up and they're not being tracked and things get sold at an expo when someone doesn't know what they're buying fully, then it messes everything up. Yeah, that, that's something. And, and that is also sometimes something you often see. Um, I, I recently learned that like the skill of snakes, of course, that's, that's some the discussion on its own. But yeah, they come yeah. from the, from the Amoli bloodline and there are, um, uh, Kenyan Samboas, which are different colors, but they are also are apparently mixed with some other Samboa species. A lot of people don't know that. And uh, especially when we're talking about animals that are having a very rough time in nature, and there are even projects with bloodlines and stud books and, and maybe the possibility to one day, chances is very small, but still send them back and reintroduce them maybe, if, even in, in, in smaller preserves. Uh, there's a big difference uh, of danger there. 
Yeah, no, yeah. definitely. Let, let's talk about those stud books, for example, because I know this is a question that Liam is interested in. He was my guest a couple episodes yeah. ago. And yeah. stud books is something that I was really only familiar with in sort of a zoo setting uh, in, in the in North America. Well, I guess everywhere we have the, the stud books that are, you know, in the zoo, zoological facilities. But you can actually be part of a stud book as a private keeper. Yes, yes. There, there's an organization uh, in Europe, I believe it started in the Netherlands actually by uh, Henk Zwarteport, um, who unfortunately uh, passed away. But there's the European Stud Book Foundation and uh, those have, have stud book keepers where it's are either zookeepers or private hobbyists and individuals that just have a passion for uh, the species and they want to preserve them. It's often for species that are again are, are endangered or on the threat of being endangered and what pretty much happens is they they register which people have which animals uh, sometimes animals get confiscated for instance and of course so and often they try to send them back but it's not always possible so they they end up uh, in here or so, uh, anywhere else and they need to find a home but you can sell them and they don't have correct citus pa papers, of course. So then they get uh, like pretty much the property of this European stud books and they get uh, distributed between, again, zoos, but overall private keepers, keep these animals, raise these animals, and when possible, exchange them and try to breed them to have at least a captive colony or bloodline uh, yeah, available or present in the hopes that in the future that might help preserve the species. And actually, the goal is for me to have all my Asian, all the species there are stud books for, will be in a stud book. So what are the, what's the process you have to go through to get the animal into the stud book? Um, I, I'm not fully informed on that yet. I'm actually uh, hope to do uh, a video about it in the near future with the uh, uh, current chairman, Lawrence, uh, about what's the main goal and, and how it works and et cetera, and what we as a hobbyist can do and be a part of. But it differs also a bit per stop book. Like some stop books are just uh, trying to rehome confiscated animals. And some stop books are also more to learn, for instance, about the different differences between locales, including genetic differences from the Hermann's tortoise, et cetera. So it differs a bit. But in general, you can just approach a stop bookkeeper uh, via the website and say, hey, I have this and this animal, and I would like to include it in the stop book. And then they see if that animal can be in addition, uh, depending on bloodline, age, which species it is, uh, et cetera. And then they can take it in there and they just simply get a number and then they know, okay, uh, Stefan has a male of that species. Hank in, in Czechia has a female of that species. We need to try to bring those together. So it also just brings people in context. That's really interesting. And it, it, it opens up a whole other aspect of the hobby for some people. If you have people who are very serious, advanced keepers, that's a great way to have them involved in conservation. It's something that you may not have thought of before. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, again, I'm really looking forward to doing that video, but I feel like pretty much every keeper that's a, a bit involved in his hobby, and if you're keeping like 10 species, I don't know, you, you can always try to get like one species that's in the stop book and add them and just that way do your part. Because I, I see a lot of videos online. I don't watch too much YouTube myself, actually, because I don't have the time with all my animals. but um, the, the videos I see, there's a lot of talk about trying to conserve a species, um, you know, getting a certain rare animal and then you're conserving it. But it's, it is not as simple as buying a rare species, maybe just even a single male or a related pair and trying to breed them. They're, they're, you can do so much more and it, it doesn't end there. You know, you're maybe conserving a species, but uh, of preserving, I should say, but certainly, certainly not conserving in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, that's a conversation I had last week on the podcast was it, that is a, a bad habit for reptile keepers to just default to saying this is for conservation when they just have like one or two animals. And you, you could maybe make the argument that 
there's some conservation things just because you might be introducing kids to them and then they get, you know, appreciation for wildlife and maybe that kid eventually goes on to be a biologist. But that's sort of a long trade, for example, to, to say that it's part of conservation. Unless you are breeding large numbers and you're actually offsetting wild caught market, it's really tough to say that you're actually part of that conservation side. The other ways you can do it is actually donate to conservation, you know, organizations that are doing the work in the places where you're trying to conserve the animals. But a stud book is a great way to just get your foot in the door. Absolutely. And even at that point, you're not just a single keeper keeping one or two animals. Those one or two animals are part of a group now. So then all of a sudden, it's, 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 there's much more potential for it. So I, I absolutely love the idea. And I, I again, uh, if you want to do something back towards your hobby and take a bit of responsibility, then I think that it's very interesting. Um, it's, you can learn a lot because you meet a lot of people there. And uh, it's, it's a, a, yeah, a great way to do your part, I would almost uh, say. And like you say, um, a lot of those organizations also work on site. Mm -hmm. So they don't, don't only have uh, animals in captive collections, but they also have reservations and they, they educate people there about the care and the breeding and they do uh, research there, you know, turtle, su turtle survival lines, TSA does that a lot. I, I saw you uh, actually have some of your income from the channel donated to yep. uh, Peruvian, I believe. Yep, yeah, that's yep. just awesome. That's, mm -hmm. that's, it's a small thing, but it goes a long way. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and that's exactly the message that I try to give all the time is how can we take responsibility? Because it is a privilege to be able to keep the animals. We, of course, like it, it's, it's definitely a privilege. We definitely don't need that right. But there are ways that we can improve society with it. And uh, you know, a lot of those species in those stud books are difficult to breed or people don't understand how to breed them. Right. So there's also some we need those expert keepers to come in and, and try to work with these species and you know allow them or get them to captively breed you know in their homes yes absolutely absolutely and uh, of course there are a lot of animals uh, now that that like the shinosaurus um i i see yeah, i see a lot of shinosaurus captive bred real captive bred being offered and i wouldn't be surprised if there's more animals being bred in in captivity almost than than they are available in in the wild the Vietnamese population, which is, which is not as highly represented, at least not legally, um, is, is like down to 100 individuals. The wild population? Yeah, the Vietnamese, uh, the, the Chinosaurus, you have the Chinese population uh, divided over three different locations, and you have the Vietnamese uh, population, and those uh, are supposed to be at like 100 or lower individuals in, in the wild. And these are the crocodile lizards for anyone that's not yeah, familiar with yeah, the Latin name. Yeah, yeah. Those are a really interesting looking species. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. I advise them to everyone. I actually also have the Lantanotus bornensis, the Borneo ears monitors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are have, wild. Yeah, a lot of people go crazy over those. And I always say, take the genius I was. Just, uh, how come? More interesting? Uh, the, the looks of the Lantanotus are, of course, wonderful. And they, and they have a very weird behavior, like this monitor monitor like moving lizards on the water and using their tongue on the water and death rolling and etc but the shinosaurus first of you see them way more uh, they have a lot of uh, behavior between each other so a lot of social interaction they have a lot of different uh, body positions they use and ways of communicating with their heads and, and uh, etc um, the way you keep them is very cool you know combination of water and, and plants I love that combo yeah, you have a lot of that. really cool like paludarium setups where it's just like arboreal and then underneath just a bunch of really nice clean water. That's so cool. Yeah, that's that's I, I love that stuff. So those those lizards fit perfectly in in that, and they're cheaper. It's also nice. Yeah, yeah, and they just look yeah. so cool. Yeah, yeah, they they are they are amazing. You have a lot of different lines, and even between individuals, you can see the difference in stripes on their faces and the color on their belly. And, and their behavior, etc. Well, they're all in all, they're to me. They you don't have to keep them too warm. They go through hibernation. The, uh, food is readily available to them, you know. Um, so yeah, it's it's just an awesome lizard to keep. 
Yeah, those guys are, if anyone wants to see them, they're in your last video that you posted with the cold room yeah. tour. The cold room is something that really fascinates me because uh, you, I think we'll maybe talk about it now. You, you, Those animals in that room entirely all go through a hibernation together and you bring the temperature down. So can you talk a little bit about that room? And I, I, was, I was amazed at how cold you let that room get. Yeah, it's... I have to say, in, in the beginning, it's, uh, it was very strange for me to keep reptiles that way. It's, you know, you're so used to the image terrarium with light, lighting and, and, and substrate and et cetera, and heat and, and whatever. And so it was very strange for me. It actually started when I, I used to keep uh, Vipera species, so vipers from the Paleos group, which were Vipera Kasnakovi, uh, Orlovi, Diniki, all the species that come from more mountainous ranges. And what I did then was I actually had a big fan above my window and they need a big difference in day and night temperature. At least that was what we thought at that time. And what I did was I pulled in at night, a day it was closed and at night I pulled in all this cold air so I already did that a bit a few years ago. And this time I was like, okay, I'm just going to try because some of the species you can even keep outside, you know? Wow. And then a uh, while ago, uh, I got some gastroteca, which are the marsupial frogs from Peru. Yeah. They are also found in really high elevations. And a, a friend of mine uh, brought them to me and he said, you need to keep these in, in that small room, the cold room. And, and I was like, okay. I was like, okay. And I put them there. And at six degrees, they were still calling. Wow. Yeah, yeah so, it was really strange. So I think in the summertime, it's sort of a normal... Um, what, what's the temperature there in the that you have in a regular sort of summertime? Yeah, winter is about 7 to 10. Uh, now it's 16 and a half, 17. And in summertime, it, it just goes up to... 24, 25, so average, and you know, it's not extremely cold or extremely um, hot in there, and uh, it also stays cooler in there during the summer, so we had a period when the temperatures were 30 degrees and higher for, for like a week or two, and even then the room temperature in the base was 24, 25 degrees. Right. Yeah, yeah. so to drop down to six, so I have a chart on my wall because we have lots of American listeners. Yeah, but it's a little bit too far for me to. It's probably like thirteen degrees Fahrenheit, or no, 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 not thirteen. No, like tw it'd be like forty degrees or something. I, okay. I can't see it from here. Yeah. So that that, that seems I, I'm a, a Celsius person, so I'm I'm familiar with six degrees, but yeah. that is really cold. And in terms of like, how cold does your winter get outside? Because I know what you said in the videos, you just leave the window open and let the natural air come through. Do you guys? You guys must dip below zero though. Yeah, not, not a lot anymore, actually. Our winters are getting uh, warmer and warmer, almost to an extent, maybe in the future, I need to use a refrigerator because our winters are not cold enough. Wow. I hope that won't be the case. But um, yeah, our winters are in general, uh, even if the day temperature in winter is like uh, 7 to 8 or 9 degrees or 11, then the night temperature are often around freezing point. Okay. Something like that. And I had the room dip to 3 degrees. So three degrees Celsius, that is. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Once or twice, but that was when the winters were really cold. And do you have anything in the room to make sure that it doesn't go below zero in there? Do you have the will a heater come on or something? Yeah, there's there's actually uh, the general heating of my house. There's one uh, like tube in there, and that that one uh, when I heat my house gets a bit warm and it just keeps it there. I'm I'm I do have thermostat in there, and I also. Uh, uh, check it every day, um, but I don't have really like a central heater in there. Right, that's really Which interesting. It's really odd because you keep it up to pretty much chance, but it's just uh, a bit of uh, experimenting, experimenting beforehand. So it was just not like, oh, I'll open up the window and see what happens. You know, it was something that developed over over time. At first, it was just a hibernating room, so I just had animals in there that I put in a box in that room and I just opened the window and, and saw what happened, et cetera. And I checked them. Sometimes I closed it a bit, et cetera. And now it just goes very natural to me. Yeah. It's really interesting. And I mean, I think 
because I have more cold weather to deal with than warm weather. And it would be much easier for me to create a cold room, although I'd have to heat it because we get much, much colder in the winter. Yeah. But it yeah. would be easier to maintain a colder room than it is to con maintain a warm room. And I think that's one area where people are starting to realize is that a lot of animals, that reptiles that we keep in captivity, do have pretty significant temperature drops, especially in the winter and especially at night, like getting into... I, I, I'm stuck between Fahrenheit and Celsius all the time, but for people, the Americans, yeah. like there's lots of temperatures that drop into like the 60s, which would probably be like 15 or something like that Celsius. And I think that's a healthy climate cycle for animals to go through is get them through that drop, night drop and, and bring the heat up in the day and warm their bodies back up. But like you said, we're so used to just have constant heat on for every species. There's always a heat mat and everything that I think people are uncomfortable letting their animals cool. I'm, and I'm not suggesting that people should go out there and turn the heat off on their animals, but go look at the natural climates and see how cool it does get in the evenings. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like I said, for me, it started with those, with those fibers because... Uh, if you didn't do it that way, uh, at least it's thought by them was they're all going to drop. The only piece, uh, you know, they were all going to die pretty fast. And there were not a lot of people having luck with them, except some of my friends of mine who are still doing very great with those species. Um, I actually have a video about keeping vipers outside. Uh, and he, he's been doing that for years now. And... Uh, so I already was familiar with, with that ID and then I got my big head of turtle and everything you hear about big head of turtle, don't let it get too warm. Don't let it get too warm. And um, my dream is to keep Ozomiops again, the V's Viper. Okay. And uh, those are all also people say, keep them cold. And I don't mean like minus 10 degrees, no. but you know, cooler, keep them cooler, cooler, cooler. Yeah. So that's what started the way I keep them this way. And yeah. it's, it's just looking at your environment, where you live, what are your surroundings, what are the surroundings of the animals, and, and try to find a match. You know, you see a lot of videos on YouTube about people in Florida keeping their animals, and they all make use of their of the great weather there, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. And um, the, I think that's a very good way to go. Also, because in case a heater breaks, I don't know, then you don't have to be uh, running around all frantically trying to get the heat back up. Yeah, you want to use your natural climate as your strength, not as your weakness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it was just really interesting to hear you talk about letting temperatures drop to six to seven degrees because that's a really cold room. Like walking into that, into your house is like, man, you got to put a, put a hat on. <laughs> yeah, that, that's also the only room you often see me wear a sweater. Right, yeah, it's yeah. nice and chilly. Absolutely. So let's talk about your YouTube channel. I want to talk about your YouTube channel. We haven't even got to it yet. So tell me about the reason for starting the channel. Um, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, well, uh, when I quit the store and I, I started on the website, uh, which is mostly there just to, so for people to start recognizing the, the name um, and putting on info because uh, now in the Netherlands, when, when you sell animals, um, at a certain point, they uh, value you as a business. And uh, one of the uh, uh, things you need to do when you s sell animals is provide the people with all the information they need to properly take care of the animal to a certain extent. So uh, the responsibility, responsibility no longer lies with the, the person who buys it, of course, that person has more responsibility, but by law, I mean, but now it's the responsibility of the seller to make sure that person has all the info it needs. Huh. That's a, actually so a really interesting idea. Yeah, it's really, it's a really good one, I think. Yeah. And um, that's the reason I started the website, started putting on this info. Of, okay, this is where the animals I keep or kept. And sometimes I maybe in the future sell offspring off or whatever. And that's, I get like, Four to 5,000 uh, individual people looking for info on the website per day. Wow, that's insane. So, yeah, so there are a lot of people looking for, for info, but there's absolutely no interaction there. And uh, still, it's, it's just a blank paper and with uh, like this boundaries, keep it between this and that, put it between this and that. And it's a lot of work also because you constantly need to update when you learn new stuff. Right. Yeah. And and then I was like, okay, how 
can I uh, bring this in in a more fun way for me and also for the for the people? And that's really the reason I, I started the channel in the basis, and also just to show um, how how it can also be done, I guess, because most of the stuff I saw on YouTube, not all, definitely not all. I'm certainly not the first person uh, showing the stuff I'm doing. You know, I don't want to give off the idea that I'm uh, one of the few, but most of the stuff I saw is very different to the way I like to do it or keep them or or uh, like to bring out to the to the world, and that that's yeah that's the reason I started it. And it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, and it's still uh, trial and error and trying to figure out what you really want to bring out and what your audience is and etc. Um, but yeah, that that's the main reason. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of work, and it's one of those I always compare it to. It's like you're study for a test and you write the test and then you fail it and then the teacher doesn't give you any of the tests back so you don't know what you got wrong like you're just constantly exploring in the dark and hoping that you find something that the, the people want to see but i think you're definitely right you are one of the few channels that shows i don't know if there's i, I don't want to make an absolute statement but i don't know any large collections or collections that are as large as yours that have the care quality that you have it's very rare and unfortunately youtube the algorithm focuses on, hey, here's all my pets, crazy things happen. But when we have an individual like you who has these amazing care you know, standards, it's, uh, it's very few and far between. So I think it is something that people want to see for sure. Yeah, I, I, again, I appreciate that. Honestly, I don't think my, my care is certainly not yet at the point I want it to be. I, I don't think it's, uh, it's uh, the best out there. Uh, honestly, there, there's a lot that can still improve. Um, of course, there's also a lot I have already improved, but mm -hmm. and and also uh, I don't think my collection is unique. It's just unique on YouTube. Yeah. And uh, the, the, I I, the, I I really hope to bring more uh, of other people's collection to my channel, but but new, now due to the whole COVID situation, it's a bit different. Yeah. Um, but again, it was just not something I saw a lot. And it's also not something uh, in Europe we are used to, you know, taking the camera to someone and putting them on screen like, hey, you know, <laughs> let me check out your animals and show the world, you know, they're yeah, yeah. like, no. They want to be behind the camera. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a, it's a bit of a difficult, but I have some friends that allowed me to shoot at their um, collection and now more people are open to it because they see the way I bring it, I guess. And uh, I also try to stay away from clickbait and, and certain titles, etc. Because, yeah, I have I do have a certain few, of course. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And it, and it seemed like you did you originally start it in Dutch and then you switched to English or because there are some videos where it seemed like you kind of had two streams going at once. But now you've maybe just switched to permanent English. Yeah, I, I started in Dutch mainly because it was all very also new to me and I was a bit unsure of, okay, how I'm going to do this. So, and there's absolutely no Dutch channel in, in the way that I, I bring it forward. At least I have not found it. And in the meantime, I've seen some people bringing out cool stuff. So that's cool. But there were a lot of other European people asking me, like, uh, can you do at least subtitles or whatever? Uh, because they they were also interested in it so i started in dutch simply because it's my native tongue but in the meantime it's almost easier for me to to speak in english in the in the videos um also because there's a lot of language barriers in europe you no know, we don't have one language you no know, yes uh, only in belgium there are already two different kinds of of language right and then we have netherlands and then with germany and then we have poland and there's in the eastern parts of Europe, like Czechia and Hungary and, and Russia, these people have amazing collections and so much knowledge. And, and Germany is, is just like filled with, with experience. So going to English was just a natural way to, to try to step over that language barrier. Yeah. yeah. You know that yeah, it obviously that makes sense, and I, I know a lot of Europeans do speak English, so it does it does help out, and um, yeah, it, the videos are very entertaining. So it would be awesome if you could go check out other collections as well, because I know it would be 
new to YouTube. But like you said, there's lots of people that are just focused on their animals and they don't have time to try to make a YouTube channel and, and share their knowledge with people, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that will be very interesting again to show what, just to show what's possible. It's not even to preach a certain way or to think this is the way you need to do it or whatever. It's just there. there's so much possible within our hobby you know you there's so much to discover and explore and it's all a big adventure to me and and there are so many different ways uh, people keep the animals and it's it's also um, the idea of exchanging just ideas you know every time I visit a person even if I have visited them 10 times when I go there we talk about some certain things and something comes up and you, you learn from each other and it would just be great just to have a camera standing somewhere uh, in the meantime, look up some amazing animals and just learn, you know, it's a win-win situation because I get to show people cool stuff and it's cool content for my channel. That's of course, I want my channel to, to grow, but in the meantime, I learn and the viewer learns and maybe we can talk about those ideas, etc. Yeah, no, definitely. Can you tell me about the, the tags that you make? Like, it seems like a lot of the enclosures you have, I'm not sure about all of them, but it seems like a lot of them, you have these like name tags or information tags. Uh, have, did, is that something that you just made on your own? Uh, yeah, I made, that, um, I made them myself. Of course, the ID is again, not new. Yeah. There's a lot of name tags. Um, I, I make sure I at least have it on all the enclosures of my venomous snakes. Um, just because in case I get a bite, the, the base info is on that on that small slide. Of course, there's, it's never going to be enough, but at least the base for somebody that's like, okay, holy shit, what, what the hell is going on here? Because our medical uh, uh, emergency uh, people, you know, they, they have no idea yeah. w- what they need to do when my mamba bites me. God forbid. But... Um, so I want to make sure that it's also a bit of responsibility I take to inform those people in case something like that happens. And of course, it's also just uh, by law, I, am, um, I, 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 I must inform people about the animals I keep when they enter a certain area. It's just the same as having you know, a, 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 a small um, board on your garden, like saying, oh, there's a guard dog here and it might bite. You know, you're by law. You're you need to do that because otherwise, if a person enters your your garden and there's a dog there that bites it, you're responsible. Right. It's pretty much the same for my venomous snakes. And also, again, I yeah, I just like the way it looks. <laughs> yeah, that's it, it. Is very organized, and I feel like there's even some where it it looks like are they climate graphs or you have you have something printed out next to them that look like a bar graph or a line graph. Are those yeah, climate? I have- I, yeah, I, I want to improve them because uh, there there's more information, of course. But indeed, for pretty much all the species, so not on every enclosure, because I keep a lot of animals separate. Um, but at least for every species, I have looked up the climate graphs when it comes to humidity, when the most rain falls and the temperatures, minimums, lows, etc. During the seasons, I have this like small chart on my uh, enclosure. Uh, on there Um, simply also because uh, then I can see oh I need to mist a bit more now now in the natural range the humidity would spike so I need to check if my humidity is correct if that's the case don't need to do anything if that's not the case I need to mist extra etc where where do you get the data from for those charts is it just like a weather website uh no there's a oh i don't know the link i could i can send you uh, later on but there's a certain website i use most but what i do is i i have a lot of books oh yeah like a and bookshelf w- yeah what i do is i i look up the animals from like um travel guides and etc over the fauna or in this case snakes or snakes from arabia or snakes from Borneo, or whatever and uh, there's often a certain location with that snake. So it's actually where the snake is found. There's like a, a location, a, a town or a res- reserve or mountain at what height. And I just type in that plus climate and I get all this info. Yeah. And yeah, I, I check it and also make sure it's not like in a town because often the climate in the town is very different than it would be on the mountain. Yeah. That's the way I do it. 
yeah, I always say to people that the best place you can get climate data is from like a national park or something that's very far away and they have, you know, the weather station that's away from urbanization and that way it's getting good, accurate data. But if you do have that website, I would love to see it and I'll include it in the show notes for people because that's one of the biggest things is understanding the climate of the animal that you live in and or that, that they live in. And so often care guides or care sheets don't give you that. It just gives you the the range of temperatures and then you kind of go from there. But there's so much more we can do. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think there's a there's a place for care guides. You know, it's, for some people, it can be a nice place to start, but it's certainly not set in stone. And you, you definitely need to observe your animal and, and don't read just one care sheet, read a thousand and watch a thousand videos and then look up in a thousand books and try to figure out, you know, what what you can find in there and, and look at the climate itself. If you can't find it, also, you know, I, I keep some animals not everybody keeps, but maybe I can't find info for a certain species of Asian pit viper, but maybe there's a snake there in the same region at the same altitude, uh, living the about the same way of life, you know, when it comes to activity, etc., from that same range that's kept a lot more. And I just look up the info on that, and again, I try to translate that to what I keep. Yeah, and then just watch the animal and see how it reacts. And yeah, yeah, and that's of course that's also why I keep them a bit more natural, and I provide them with options um, because. When, especially when I was young, thermostats, we, we didn't know about that. I had no idea yeah. there were thermostats. So I had a long terrarium and there on one side there was heat and on one side there was a water bowl. And, and depending on the way my animal is very rudimentary, but still um, moved between uh, those levels, I knew what I was needed to adjust. Right. Yeah, yeah. They, they are the best teachers. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. For your crocodile lizards, what is the background you're using in those enclosures? It kind of looks like wooden sticks or something. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it is. Oh, they're they're uh, tree fern panels. Oh, tree fern panels. And yeah, is, that, but is that a product that that you can buy in Netherlands that's for that, or is it for something different? No, that's just for a terrarium hobby. I believe it's a lot used a lot in paludariums. Also, you have two variants. You have the soft one, and you have the more harder one, the xoxine, which is actually a fern palm tree. And, mostly found in New Zealand, et cetera. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you, they just cut it and slice and you stick it to your back wall and plants love it because there's a lot of structure for them to hang on. And sometimes mosses will uh, grow out of it uh, just spontaneously, et cetera. So. Yeah, it just looks like a very simple background, but it looks good. It just looks like it's easy to install, which is kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It is flat. So you, you absolutely need to make sure that you put in a lot of plants. That's why I say I don't like my setup now mm-hmm. um, in that video because it's just flat with some tree trunks in front of it. And me, that's not decorating a setup. that's just throwing in a pile of stuff and hope it works out. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm, I always say my terrariums need to mature. You know, they need to start to grow and develop. Um, so it is flat. So you need to add structure definitely to have some depth and for the decoration, et cetera. And uh, there was a time that uh, way more trees that were cut than, than needed. And it uh, almost became uh, uh, rare, I should say. So there's a different supplier of it now. But yeah, it looks cool. Yeah, yeah, it does look very cool. In terms of future plans for you, do you have any animals on your list that you're, you're getting soon? Or do you have any future goals with what you're up to? Uh, for now, I really love what I like, of, uh, love what I keep. And uh, the main goal is my, my rooms and, and the setups. Um, it's really important to me that uh, I have all the setups standing ready, even if I just have the animals at the baby from when they are adults. So that's why I also have a lot of stuff empty because I know there's something going in there when it gets older. And my main focus uh, uh, will, will definitely be just my turtles and, and getting more different kinds of species of Asian pit vipers. And I'm adding some, some Asian red snakes because they are a lot of fun. They are, they are active and that helps, you know, because I yeah. have a lot of stuff that just sits there. Yeah, I saw that you recently got some rhino rat snakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm also getting the Oreo cryptophis and, and Klimacophoras, and, which are the bamboo red snakes and the Japanese red snakes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Those uh, little smaller ones, snakes. yeah. 
yeah, stuff like that. Just because it's because it's fun, it's something I can handle, etc. But my main focus is definitely be uh, my turtles and the Asian pit vipers. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I love what you're up to. I love the channel and uh, I, I'm glad that you spent the hour here chatting with me because you, I think you have a, a really good mindset and it's a mindset we're starting to see in North America, but it's something that has way more potential in terms of fulfillment when it comes to being involved in this hobby. There's so much more than just having a rack of snakes and, and breeding the next morph. We can be, there, there's just way more exciting things to come if you really put your mind into quality of care and conservation. And so I'm, I'm really happy you spent the time here telling us your whole story. Can you let everybody know where you can be found online? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, on YouTube, mostly uh, Terrarium Channel is the, is the name. I also uh, have under the same name on Instagram, but I, I'm, I'm not very good at the whole social media stuff. So mostly on YouTube. And uh, again, I'm glad people like it. Of course, I, I have also kept animals and wrecks, et cetera. But like you say, the fulfillment is so much higher. And especially if you're somebody that goes in it from a hobby standpoint and interest for these animals, uh, you can only enjoy them properly and take care of them properly in, in this manner and not in a plastic box. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree. Well, Stefan, this was a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining me today. Again, thank you so much for having me on. All right, that brings us to the end of that episode. Stefan, thank you very much for joining me for the hour. That was a fascinating conversation. I really love what you're up to and I will continue to watch your videos. I can't wait to watch the rest of your room tours because I'm so interested to see how you care for the animals and how clean and enriching and natural everything is. It is awesome and I hope that as a listener, you go check his channel out and get some ideas from his care style because it's really incredible. For anything that we chatted about in the podcast, you will find information on in the show notes, including that Clima data website that Stefan was talking about. That's where he gets his climate information from for the animals he keeps. That is in there as well as links to his Instagram and YouTube and everything else you will need. Now to the listeners, thank you so much for listening to this episode. I do really appreciate it. The support that you guys are showing me is truly overwhelming and I do really enjoy making these podcasts and I hope you're enjoying listening to them. If you want to say hi or if you do want to just shoot me a message and recommend another guest for the podcast, definitely do that. You can send me a DM on Instagram at animalsathome.ca or send me an email hello at animalsathome.ca. Thank you very much to our show's sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. I highly encourage you to either check them out on Instagram or their website. If you are looking for some new lighting or substrate or backgrounds or new enclosures, they are definitely the first stop I would make. And if you do end up purchasing something, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you. All right, that is the end for this episode. I will catch you guys next week.